Hello friends, this is Chad Coffin, welcoming you to the River Church Telecast with Pastor Dale Berry. I'll be back at the end of the program to give you more information on the River Church Knoxville. Now let's join Pastor Dale Berry. I, I said I was going to tell you more about the code, didn't I? More about the code. The code, I shared last week, the code is, he speaks in parables. Okay, another part of the code is there's another level of clarity. It's clear. Another level of the code for you to understand right now is God is not withholding anything from his people. Those that are right, the righteousness of God in Christ. He's releasing everything to us. He's not withholding anything. God, did, God called you to the kingdom for such a time as this and then he decided not to tell you what weapons you needed. I don't think so, right? God called you to the kingdom for such a time as this and he has empowered you to be the glorious church in this hour. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Now, why are they going to be glorious, and why are they going to be without spot, wrinkle, or blemish? Because they're going to tap into what Jesus did for them and stand on it even though they're imperfect. They're going to accept that he called them righteous even though they ain't done everything right. They're going to take Jesus as their personal Savior, which cleanses them from all their sins even though they were a terrible sinner. They're going to receive the word of the Lord that says he's coming back for a glorious church, which means a victorious, victorious, dominating the forces of darkness, believer, and church. They're going to see that in the clarity that I'm talking about, and they're going to walk in that. You say, well, I haven't been saved but a year, Pastor Dale. It's not going to matter. God's going to grow people quickly. He's going to grow them supernaturally quickly. You know, I saw this on foreign soil when I went to Guatemala. We preached to 100 pastors. And over there, I mean, I didn't preach to 100, but there's 100 over there. We preached to a lot of pastors from a lot of different uh, time frames and, and levels. But there were pastors. Some of them haven't been saved very long at all. And they're pastoring. Well, I believe you should get equipped. I believe you should too, but I'm not the one to make the call on what it takes to equip you. I'm not the one that gets to make the call on how soon he puts you in ministry. Or how far you go, how fast you go, how high you go, irregardless of what it looks like compared to what I'm doing. It's not my call. Amen. But you know what? God will grow somebody up fast. There's, you know, there's some young people right now on YouTube that are just, I mean, they're millennials. And young people, young people that are just so on fire for God. And the word that they bring has got such a depth of the spirit on it, you know? And I'm thinking... Where did they come from? I've never even heard that name. And they've got the cutting edge message that the whole church needs right now. Because that's what God's doing right now. Amen. You say, well, why don't he make my grandchildren grow at the speed I grew? Because if he does, they'll die in battle. <laughs> they got to have the weapons of their warfare. It's the same weapons you got, but it's enhanced. It's accelerated. Amen. Amen. So the code is clarity. Clarity. Except, just except in simplicity. I'm his sheep. I hear his voice. I don't follow no other. May not be great English, but you get the point. You know what I'm saying? It's that simple. You say, well, I just don't know. Just, you, you'll see. You'll see. You'll be sitting at home. He'll say, get off the couch and go pray. And it'll be the first time you heard him talk to you like that. And you'll say, Whoa! Then you'll go in there and pray. Some great big revelation or great big ordering step will come to you and it'll radically change your life. You say, well, I'm Baptist. So am I. So what's that got to do with it? I saved in the Southern Baptist Church at the age of nine. That make me less or more saved? No. I'm bought by the blood of Jesus. He died for my sins, and I asked him to come in and be my Savior and Lord, take my sins away, and, and, and I gave him my life. He gave me his, I gave him mine. That's the only way it works. 
Amen. It's really not 50-50. It's 100 to 100. You know, it's really what it is. Our assignment determines our stand, okay? And the book is your first assignment. Once you get your steps ordered, you take the book everywhere you go on assignment. Amen? Could I have said that and then left all them rabbit trails off? Or did we? I guess we need them rabbit trails, didn't we? Amen. We cannot forget why we are here. Why are we here? Back to the commission we just read from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All power, Jesus said, has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Now, here's one thing that we're, we're, our, we're assigned to do. Go. And then he says, and teach all nations. Teach. Baptizing them, baptize. Well, why we got to baptize? Because people need to make a change in their life. They need a change in their life. They really need to be water baptized. They need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, Pastor, I'm not sure where there be any Holy Ghost. Well, they weren't sure in the book of Acts either after they were really, really saved. They said, we know Jesus, we love Jesus, but we don't know where there be any Holy Ghost. Start reading in the book of Acts. You'll find out there's a Holy Ghost. Amen? You say, well, I, you know, I, do I need to be baptized to go to heaven? I, I, I'm not talking about do you need to be baptized to go to heaven. I'm trying to tell you, if you get the full revelation of what water baptism is, it will affect your walk with God and make you more free of sin. Not because the provision wasn't already there in the Word, it was. I'm just saying, it's like when you take communion. You take communion believing that there's healing in, in that, that there's cleansing in that blood or that cup, and there's healing in the broken body of Jesus. You take that, and you make that a point of contact. That's what you do with water baptism, if you know about it. Otherwise, you just get wet, maybe. <laughs> it's okay to get wet. Everybody needs a good bath once in a while, right? <laughs> it's okay to get wet. But why not find out what baptism is, baptism is about before you go into the water? It's identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, when you come out of that, it's symbolic of you walking in newness of life. But it's really more symbolic, more than symbolic. There's a transference of anointing for you to walk right in that baptism if you know about it. If you didn't know about it, I, I don't uh, not recommend you get baptized again if you want to. I'm not saying you didn't get anything. I'm just saying if you really feel like you needed to understand before you're baptized, you can get water baptized again if you want to. I mean, I haven't. I got baptized one time when I was nine years old. I didn't know everything, but, you know, I'm, I'm in the Word. I'm learning. Amen. So go, teach, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That, well, what do I go and not do and teach and what do I do? The next verse, verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. What are you going to teach them? Everything you know. <laughs> what am I going to teach the people I witness to? Tell them everything you know. What, how do I witness to people? Tell them what the Lord has done for you. Don't I need the Roman road? You need to be in the book, and if you're in the book, when you open your mouth, it'll be filled. Amen. You mean I don't have to learn everything doctrinally before I go? I don't think, Jesus didn't do that. Once they signed up to follow, he said, go over in the upper room and wait. In a few days, you're going to be in due to the power, then you're going to go. You think they had time to get totally indoctrinated? I doubt it. Now, did he walk with them and teach them as he was? Yeah. But listen, if we wait till we got it all, we're not going. <laughs> Isn't it true? Because the fact of the matter is, at down here, with you on full speed ahead with God, you still see through a glass darkly. You ain't going to see everything face to face until you get there. But yet, he still said, I've equipped you, go and teach them. Go and teach everything that I've taught you Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, lo means down here where we are. High means up there where he is, right? <laughs> lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Are you telling me that the Lord is going to be with me on a great level, even with all that's going on in the world? More so, if anything, at least as much. Amen. Key word in our stand Key words in our stand. There's three key words in our stand, okay? Go, fight, and take. Now, why do I go first? Because you ain't even started till you get up off the couch. 
So get off your chair in a few minutes here and get out there and get the job done. Well, I'm just intimidated about talking to people. You ain't intimidated talking to them about the balls. Amen. Yeah. You ain't intimidated about talking to them about the tithe. But you can't talk about Jesus. But you can roll with the tithe, baby, like it's nobody's business. If you're a Bama fan, I know what I'm talking about. You can roll with the tide. Roll over everybody you play. Bring a championship uh, seven or eight times out of about ten years. You can, do, you can talk about a championship in football. Well, why can't you talk about your champion Jesus? Because I don't know that much about him. What has he done for you? That's all you need. It wouldn't hurt to be in the book so that he can bring scriptures to your remembrance by supernatural recall when you talk to him. And it wouldn't hurt to have a few scriptures lined up if you can get it. But don't let the devil talk you out of going because you don't know the whole book. Neither did the first ones he sent. Amen. They went with what they knew. Amen. Listen, these guys, before they got told to mature, somebody, it didn't go the way they wanted it to go. He, they called down fire on them. Kill them, God! <laughs> you know? That's just the level of maturity they had. That is not God. Right? So three key words, go, fight, and take. One, go into all the world. We just read those scriptures in Matthew 28. We don't have to read them again. We read them twice. Number two, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. Now, there's a lot in that scripture. You're supposed to go and enter the fight. What is the fight? It's a fight of faith. It's, huh? It's the stand. Yeah, that's right. Because that's what you're going to have to have when you go. It's the stand. Go and be prepared to fight, but don't be prepared to fight flesh and blood. Be prepared to fight with faith. And I know how you feel in the flesh. I got two brothers that were thrust into a situation where they, they were smiled. They had to be, become weaponized to fight the bully. And so they, knowing they were small, they realize if they can hit them about three times real quick, right between the eyes, their eyes are going to be watering, their nose is going to be bleeding, they're going to be laying down there screaming for help, crying, please don't hit me no more. Don't matter how big they are. But that's not the way we fight. Because probably on your best day, bullets don't bounce off of you. Isn't that right? You're probably not bulletproof, but you are proof through faith. You are death proof if you're in faith. They can't kill you if you're walking with God in faith. What do you mean they can't kill you? I mean, <clears throat> I got a friend who had a vision a few months ago about troops marching down her street, and she saw to the point, I may have this not exactly right, but this is what I remember here. She saw it to the point where if God needed to, they wouldn't be able to see her sitting in her house when they looked through the window, if necessary. You know, if you study the Bible, you'll find out people were translated. They were here one second, translated somewhere else the next, and then translated back. God has got it, man. He's got it. And you're on his side. Who's on the Lord's side of you? Amen. You're on the same team he is. Isn't that right? So, so fight the good fight of faith. It says, lay hold on eternal life where until thou art also called. So what that tells me, the call for somebody that's called to fight the good fight of faith, the call for them is to lay hold on what God promised them. They always lay hold on it if they're in faith. Always. If you start out in faith and stay in faith, you will get what God promised you. You say, well, man, it didn't happen in time, didn't it? Oh, you all of a sudden know the deadlines that God don't know? Amen. Well, November 4th is election day. I don't think that's heaven's interpretation. Heaven's got a wider interpretation. You know what it is? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, God's merciful, and God tries to work with man. Don't he? He tries to work with people. But you can't go down a path that attacks people and expect to continue to win, even if it looks like you're winning right now. Because God's whole concept is about laying down his whole life and agenda.
to save mankind. What did Jesus come for? What was his assignment? To seek and save that which is lost. And he came down here and he did everything he needed to do for that to be possible. Then he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. He went to prepare your mansion, didn't he? I like last week I said this. I suggest to you that it's probably already ready for you. I'll bet you he got all that done pretty quick. Because the last scripture I've seen what he's doing is I see that he's seated beside the Father. He's not building a mansion right now. He's right beside the Father. And he's praying for us. Till his enemies be made his footstool. And he's not got anything else to do to make his enemies bow. He provided the way for them to be under our feet. So now it's up to us to make him bow. You mean we got authority over all this? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. But we got to fight in the right arena, don't we? The third one, take. Take dominion. Wayne, he didn't steal my thunder. He confirmed my thunder. <laughs> in the offering scripture, he didn't know I had this in my scripture, in my, in my sermon. But Psalm 115, 16 says, The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. Amen. So God gave control of the earth to us. Oh, I would never say that. Well, don't ever expect it to work for you then. I, I understand it being a little off for you. If you hadn't seen that before, just get in the book. It's coming. Stay in the Bible. You'll start to see your proper place. Amen? Amen. So in conclusion, the three things you need to take away from today in the stand is go scripturally, fight scripturally, and take scripturally. Take dominion. Take dominion. God told Abraham, he said, get up and go. I'm going to lead you to a certain place. You had not been there maybe, but I'm going to lead you to a certain place, and, I want, and you're going to take dominion, and you're going to possess the land. Amen? Well, Pastor, you know, what can this few of us do in here? Well, I want to put 1,000 to fly, two to put 10,000 to fly, add it up. Better yet, multiply it. You know what I'm saying? God is not working on additional surface looking equations God is not looking at me and Kathy and saying one plus one is two matter of fact God's got a whole different concept about that he looks at me and her and he says one plus one is one and then he says but the power of agreement between you is even superior to the power of just two basic believers because she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, we get to operate in the believer's authority and the power of agreement as believers, and it goes to another whole level because we're one already. Yeah. It's just how it works. Makes you want to go get married, don't it? <laughs> and it should ultimately, right? It should. So go, fight, and take, or possess would be another word you could use right there. Go, fight, and possess. Amen? So my bonus message attached to this is the believer's authority. And it's six pages. I will email it to you if, I have, if you get me your email. I will email it to you. And it's a study I preached before, but it's, it's a lot more information than what I shared today. Now that scripture I just read out of Psalms is in that sermon. So that whole concept of doing that is in there. Amen? And I've been putting a lot more of this in the newsletter form lately. So I'm trying to even provide newsletters. There's newsletters on these tables back here. Uh, times when you come in, you'll know. If you come through the Connection Cafe back there, on your way into the, the River Church, you'll see that there's stuff on tables and there's free uh, brochures and handouts and stuff. Usually if something's on a table, it's free. Now, I, the, the RU, a success in life game, is on the table. Those aren't free, but you can play them all day. Sit there all day and play them. Except when we're preaching. It's time to come in and sit in the Word when we're preaching. Amen. And on Wednesday nights, we do the uh, Connection uh, Cafe Bible Study from the R River Church does that back here in the cafe. And we, uh, man, we have fellowship and food. We do our, we, we do our health and wellness uh, class between 6 and 7. It's just kind of laid back nonchalant. If it's just our group sitting in here and everybody wants to talk about it, we stay right here. We have a scale in another room where people go away if they want to. We don't need to know what they weigh. You need to say something about that, honey. As a group in the church, we've lost 39 pounds in what, a week? 
In a week as a church, we've lost 39 pounds. Amen. Praise God. And that's even with Randy gaining because he's supposed to gain. He needs to gain weight. I've been handing him off a pound here and there when I. Yeah. Huh? There you go. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just wait on the Lord just for a second. Thank you, Jesus. We're done early today. Praise God. We got plenty today, though. Man, the worship atmosphere in here was so nice today. And I was I, I was occupied running the projection. I still, usually you can't, it's hard to enter in, you know, when you're busy doing a job. But, man, it was all over the room. Praise God. Thank you guys for what you do. Thank you, Annie, Wayne, and Ethan, Randy. What do you do? You do something too, don't you? Of course, I was talking about the worship team. But, yeah, Randy cleaned the church this week, helped me out do some other things. Y'all ought to go see her. Y'all ought to look at our children's church. Got a new uh, giant uh, eraser board in there, more tables. Man, it's, we're just ready. We're ready. We're just ready. I know something I was going to share with you I didn't share, and that was uh, – an illustration about my father-in-law, uh, and he's usually watching. He's probably he, he's probably watching right now. But my father-in-law is in his 80s, and uh, you know I'm I'm 20-something years behind him, but not a lot, not that much. But I'm behind him enough to know that when he talks, I ought to listen. You know what I mean? See, that's what's missing in our society today. Everybody knows everything, especially young people. You got to learn to take advantage, honor those in authority over you. Honor your father and your mother. If you'll honor and respect them properly, God will talk straight to you through them. He will. That's what he does. And so my father-in-law gave me some ideas this week on what to do to grow the church. And you know, he began to share, Kathy will tell you, it's her daddy, he began to share different times that he'd been over to our church. We used to do a lot of fellowship dinners, and they go to a different church, but they're out in time to come by and fellowship and eat with us, and they would. And so they've been to several different churches, buildings that we've been in, places we've been over the years. And, uh, and he remembered, he remembers everything. He don't forget nothing. And uh, he, he began to share some things. And, you know, one, the main thing he said to me is you just simply got to go outside those doors out there and start try, talking to people and pulling them in. It can't be that simple, Pastor. Well, the Bible says go out and compel them to come in at my house may be full. You know what that tells me? All we got to do is compel them. You mean to tell me that when we all start trying to draw them in, say, look, man, the Lord's here. He, want, he has something for you. Come worship with me. Come go to church with me. You mean when we all start doing that, the house is going to be full? According to the Bible? Well, Pastor, I've talked to people before, and I just couldn't get people to come to church. Well, maybe you need to take a little inventory and see how excited you are about the Lord. <laughs> Keep telling people. That's right. Go out and compel them to come in. They're coming. Amen. Amen. I heard a congressman say this week, when the Ted Cruz that said, tell people once they know they got antibodies and know they're not infected anymore, throw their mask away. What do you think is going to happen when people wake up one day and they say, I'm free, I'm throwing my mask away. When, it, when the society just starts concluding that there's nothing to worry about now. You know what I mean? When they get to the point, whether it's because it's gone from the building, whatever, when they get to the point and they start throwing, what is one of the first things they will do? Especially if they're Christian. They'll go, they'll go to church. They will. And I know it looks like they're staying away like crazy right now, but they're coming. They're coming. You just wait. You just wait. They're coming like crazy. And you need to be visualizing not what it would be like for the chair in front of you to be full, but what are you going to do when there's great need in the room because new people have come in. What, are you prepared for that? If you've ever been involved in farming and you had to deal with a harvest, guess what? When you gather in the harvest, you're just getting started. There's a lot more to do than just whack the hay. There's a lot more than that. A lot more than just putting in the sickle. Isn't that right? That's really where it, where it really starts. I mean, you've planted, you've watered, and now, buddy, you're starting to enter into the increase. It's different phases of harvest. Amen. 
So when you enter into harvest, it's not the same. There's a whole different kind of work to do. A lot of work to do, amen? So get ready. Start thinking about how you're going to assist people, how you're going to disciple new believers. What are you going to do to help them grow? That You're going to take the stand message, that one message. And you're going to say, oh, what did he say about, what did he say we had to do? Oh, I remember what pastor said. Go, teach, and baptize. What do I teach? I teach them to observe all things that he's commanded me. I teach them what I know he said do. It's that simple? It's that simple. Amen. You think God was just going to use the pastor to teach them all? No, the pastor is to equip saints for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is teaching others too. How many can I really realistically disciple by myself? And when I say disciple, I don't mean just preach to them on Sunday. How many can I walk with and grow up? Based on the biblical pattern, maybe 12. If Jesus chose to do it with 12, I, I probably I'll just go with this pattern. You mean you're only going to have 12 people in your church? No. I got 12. You got 12. You got 12. You got 12. And when they come, they got 12. God don't do anything just by addition. God will add to the church daily such as should be saved, not on the addition of amount. God will add 3,000 and 5,000 to a church at one time. Well, who's ready for that? You've got to instantly be ready to go rent the theater, the Coliseum. Oh, boy, would God do that? Is God going to do that in this hour? Is this the hour for that? Then guess who he's going to do that through? The plain and simple, Dale, Randy, David, Kathy, Annie, Richard. The plain and simple believers that are in this house. Those are the ones that have to be used for it because it's time. Amen. You're going to walk over to me and you're going to, you're going to walk over to me and you're going to look out. We're going to be standing here. You're going to be standing beside me looking out at the congregation. You're going to say, Pastor, who would have thought? And I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, you should have thought. <laughs> Amen. No. You see what I'm saying? It's more based on what time it is. He's not going to have any trouble using us if we're available, is he? Thank you for joining us today on the River Church program. We hope you can join us soon in one of our services. The River Church meets every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 6716 Central Avenue Pike at Callahan Drive in Knoxville, Tennessee. On behalf of Pastor Dale Berry and the River Church, I'm Chad Coffin. So